Good evening, everybody. My name is Julia Higgins, and I'm Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, so it is under my aegis that such international events as South Africa Day, or Day and a Half, as it is, uh, occur. And so it's my very great pleasure, on behalf of the Royal Society, to welcome you all here this evening. The um, event, the lecture, are being webcast, so we have audience in both possibly the overflow room, but also public and via the web. And particularly because of that, could I please ask you at this stage to switch off your mobile phones, right off, please, because they do interfere with the webcasting, and it's very unfortunate if that occurs. South Africa Day has been arranged. We've already had half a day today, and we have another whole day tomorrow to encourage interactions between science in the United Kingdom and science in South Africa. Those of us who know something about South Africa know there's a great deal of exciting science going on there, and we hope that the South African scientists who've taken the time to come over here and the events that we've planned during the two days and the talks and the posters and this lecture will encourage UK scientists to begin, if they are not already doing so, to interact with South African scientists. That's the purpose of the day, and we've already seen days. We've already seen a lot of those interactions taking place. This evening, we are extremely pleased to have with us Dr. Toby Medupe, uh, who's going to lecture to us shortly. He received his doctorate in astrophysics at the University of Cape Town in 2002, and his research focuses on the theoretical understanding of stellar oscillations in the atmospheres of stars, but he also studies dark matter, and he uses quasars as probes of dark matter. He's a research fellow at the South African Astronomical Observatory and teaches at the University of the Northwest. And there he leads the recently formed theoretical astrophysics program in the physics department. His other interests involve a study of African ethno-astronomy, which sounds wonderful to me and I'm looking forward to talking to him afterwards about that, uh, with a view to using this to attract black students into astronomy and science in general. We all know that astronomy is one of the ways that attracts young people in this country into physics and into science, and it's just the same in South Africa. To this end, Toby has been a principal investigator for a project by a team of South African scholars that's studying ancient manuscripts that were written during the Mali and Songhai empires between the 12th and the 16th centuries in the ancient city of Timbuktu. His interest in Africa's heritage has also led him to join the Cosmic Africa Project, which explores the ways that the lives of Africans past and present intersected with the heavens. He's a presenter and associate producer of the feature film Cosmic Africa. And the subject of his lecture today is Cosmic Africa, and it's really a great pleasure to welcome you, Toby, to the Royal Society and to this occasion. We look very much forward to your lecture. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. I feel very honored that I've been invited to give tonight, uh, this evening's lecture. My love for astronomy goes back to the time when I was 13 years old. And um, one thing that used to worry me and uh, that, I mean, I noticed was all the books that I read, either on my own uh, at home, you know, uh, books from the library or books from school about astronomy, uh, whenever they mentioned the history of the subject, they always, uh, there was always one part missing, and that was the history of African uh, participation of Af Africans in, in astronomy. And here by astronomy, I mean from the earliest times when ast astronomy just meant looking up at the stars and studying the movements and the patterns up there of the stars. And uh, the reason why this information was not there in our school curriculum I think it had to do with the order of the day, uh, where in South Africa, attempts were made to remove us from our history or to separate us from our history 
so that we don't aspire to become great. Um, you know, the common belief being that nothing happened in Africa uh, before the arrival of Europeans in our continent. Later, I found out about uh, this kind of information presented here in this map, which shows you what Africa was like before the arrival of, of Europeans. Um, you'll see that, I mean, especially in West Africa, there were three major empires there. The first one started probably about 1,500 years ago, uh, the Ghana Empire, which was followed by the Mali and the Songhe empires. Um, I mean, these were big empires. Uh, to give you an idea, the Ghana Empire, shown by the, I think it is the black, uh, you know, the black uh, coloring there, um, at its peak, covered an area about six times the, the area of, of the United Kingdom. That's how big uh, that empire was. And it consisted of, or it included, I mean, several millions of people. There were also other, um, you know, better, better known uh, empires in the east, in the southern east part of the continent, the Swahili empires. They all show that long before the arrival of Europeans in Africa, our people were very well organized. They, they, they led very well organized lives. Um, and they, 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 they had great empires and kingdoms, as I said. And we know this because some of the artifacts and, 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 and buildings are still there with us today. I mean, at the top there, you have the golden rhinoceros, 800 years old, made out of pure gold from the Limpopo province, uh, uh, the, one of the northern provinces in South Africa. And that picture there of the, the, the ruins at, at Great Zimbabwe. I mean, this is evidence of sophistication and, and a very well organized society. And my point here is that you couldn't have such level of organization if you didn't have good agriculture. And during those days, good agriculture meant that uh, you, know, you had to, to know the stars. You need to, to be able to predict when the rains come so that you are prepared uh, to, to work on the land. And or, so already, I mean, just from that map that you saw and, and evidence like this, there's no way that our people could not have uh, studied the heavens uh, for their daily uh, use as it was the case almost everywhere in the world. So I was lucky that in 1998, I was approached by filmmakers who wanted to make a film about uh, exactly the relationship of, of Africa to, to the stars. We selected three countries in Africa. Um, we selected Namibia, Mali, and, and Egypt. The first two countries, Namibia and Mali, we selected because there are societies still alive today who still live more or less the same way like they did 500 years ago. So that pro provided us with a perfect opportunity to show uh, you know, uh, very well in, in, in video that astronomy was, a, was very much an integral part of, of the African life as it was everywhere else in, um, on Earth. So we, were, we studied the Bushmen in Namibia, the Dogon people in Mali, and in Egypt, uh, the special thing about that was the, the Napta stones. These are stones uh, very similar to Stonehenge, which were erected about 7,000 years ago uh, in order to, uh, to study the shift in the rising positions of the sun. And here, I mean, this is really the result of the, the movement of the Earth around the sun. Anyway, I'll talk about it later. The film is, is not yet, uh, still not yet available commercially, but uh, there are plans to do that in the future. We visited the Bushmen around the time of the partial eclipse in 2001, and one of the mistakes that we did was we tried to surprise them. So what we did was, we, a couple of days before the eclipse, we told them about the eclipse. We didn't tell them exactly when it was going to happen. Uh, the idea was uh, so that we can see how they, uh, they react to an eclipse, a solar eclipse. And uh, we, got in, we almost got into trouble. During the day of the eclipse, uh, I mean, they saw us that we were prepared for the eclipse, and they were worried, you know, how, how can these people be able to uh, predict something so unpredictable and so unnatural? And it turns out that the reason why they were very angry with us was that uh, they associate 
eclipses with bad things, as it's shown, as it is shown in this rock engraving where uh, the lion, I mean, an eclipse is interpreted as a lion wrapping its tail around the sun. And, and lions, uh, according to the Bushman culture, is associated with bad, bad things, basically. So we had to apologize and explain to them exactly what causes eclipses and things like that. But, I mean, the Bushmen are fantastic storytellers. I mean, when I was there in the evening listening to them, I could only think of my two kids, you know, of how much they would benefit from, uh, uh, you know, th that kind of uh, great storytelling. So, I mean, like everyone else on Earth, they uh, made up uh, constellations. Constellations are just apparent patterns formed by stars in the sky. For example, on the left there, you have a, a pattern which is called Orion, which was called Orion by the ancient Greeks. Uh, so what the ancient Greeks saw in the sky, they saw a hunter with the three stars showing the belt of the hunter. And uh, yeah, and the, the head of the hunter is at number 12, that, written in green there. On the right is uh, the, the, the way that the, the Bushmen people perceived of the same grouping of stars. The three stars of Orion's belt, according to the Bushmen, are the three zebras. And uh, number one and two down there on the left picture uh, shows you the, the sword of the hunter. And according to the Bushmen, that sword was the arrow. And then uh, next to Orion, there's another star called Aldebaran, which, forms part, which is within that part, uh, star cluster called the Hades. And then there are the seven sisters called um, seven stars called, group of stars called the Pleiades. And the story associated with it, those patterns uh, in the sky, according to the Bushmen, is that uh, there was a man, uh, that bright star called Aldebaran, who had seven wives, and one night he decided to go hunting the three zebras, and being a poor hunter, he missed when he tried to shoot at the zebras, and uh, he was scared to go back to his wives because uh, he didn't bring them any meat, and uh, that star number five is uh, Betelgeuse. Uh, sorry. No. That star number four, I think, because things are the other way around in, South, in the south. That star number four is Betelgeuse, and according to the Bushmen, it is the lion. And, and so he was afraid also to go and get his arrow because he was scared of that lion, uh, Betelgeuse. So you can see from there that, like everyone uh, on Earth, the Bushmen and all other African people were inspired in the same way to, uh, by the night sky to form patterns in the night sky and associate uh, earthly activities with, with those uh, patterns. And then uh, the Dogon people of Mali were really amazing because they really literally live the same way like they did maybe a thousand years ago. Uh, and there you can see very clearly that stars were very much important part of their lives. I mean, they involve stars in their decorations of, in their religion. I mean, that building that you see on the left there is the, the, the main temple, you know, their main temple. And they, they make, they draw patterns of stars and the moon and so on. And uh, in the morning, they worship to the stars. And also in divination, you know, that man inside that crawl there uh, is what is called a jackal diviner and he uses uh, star patterns to predict, to predict people's uh, future. Um, another interesting thing about the Dogon was their calendar system. Their calendar system is based on the moon. It is very similar to our ancient calendar system in South Africa. So what they would do is they would work out the number of days between successive full moons, for example, and that would give them a month. And in fact, that is why in some of our languages back in South Africa, we have the same word for the moon and the month. And the num those number of days between successive full moons is actually 29 and a half days. That is the time it takes for the moon to go around the earth. If you multiply that by 12 to get a year, it gives you 354 days, which is short uh, by 11 days compared to our modern calendar, which is based on the movement of the earth around the sun. So the African calendar, uh, every year it misses 11 days. And after three years, you have lost uh, 33 days, which is 
a whole month, and people would notice that, and uh, they would add an additional month, so that after some years were 12 months long and others were 13 months long. We do the same today with, uh, with the leap years, you know. Uh, I mean, our year, we don't, we don't include a quarter of a day that is missing every year in our solar calendar. And after four years, that accumulates to a quarter times four to one day. That is why we add an additional, uh, additional day. And also, they subdivided their month into weeks of five days long. And uh, each day was named after uh, the, the place where the market is taking place. So if today the market takes place in London, today is called London. If uh, tomorrow the market takes place in Birmingham, tomorrow is Birmingham. Okay. And then <clears throat> we went to Napta, to, to Egypt, near the border of Egypt and Sudan, where those stone, uh, those stone structures I told you about are located. They work in the same way as uh, NAPTA, sorry, as Stonehenge is supposed to operate, except that they are much smaller than uh, the stones in, uh, in, in Stonehenge. And they also, but they also, uh, but they predate uh, Stonehenge by about a thousand years. So the African, the NAPTA stones were erected uh, a thousand years before Stonehenge. I mean, that is the oldest such known um, astronomical structure in the whole world. And we were lucky that when we were there, um, burial grounds were discovered around the same area of the stones. And people think that they can actually tell you more, they have more information about the people who erected those stones. Uh, I mean, that is an example of one of the, the burial, uh, I mean, skeletons of, of someone who was buried with, uh, with uh, burial goods, you know, uh, presents for the afterlife. And from the bones, they could tell, I mean, that those people were black Africans. And so the story there is that about 10,000 years ago, the monsoon rains moved up into the Sahara Desert, and the Sahara uh, used to have seasonal rains. And so these nomadic people from Central Africa used to move up to the Sahara, and they erected uh, the stone structures. And uh, they also found skeletons of, of people from the Mediterranean in that area. So it seems like that area was a trading area. But the notable thing they found there was that there was no differentiation in terms of social st uh, status. In other words, uh, the people who were there were of the same social st uh, status. Um, yeah. So... In NAPTA, you have two kinds of alignments. You have the alignment on the left, which is um, to do with the, rising, the shifting rising points of the sun. And then on the right, you have alignments um, with respect to the, the different stars that were important to these people. And uh, like Stonehenge, these rocks were moved from an area far away. I mean, these are not local rock, rocks local to that area. So, they, I mean, the, the alignments of these uh, stars must have been very important to them. Otherwise, they wouldn't take all the trouble to, to uh, move, to drag the stones. I mean, some of them are like two tons, uh, two meter, two tons uh, in weight and two meters uh, in height. And then on the left, I'll show you a, a map, basically, of what the, the solar alignment stones uh, were like. So we have one alignment which was aligned to the summer solstice. So presumably people use that alignment uh, to predict the coming of the rains. And then you have the north-south alignment uh, which people used to use to determine uh, direction in the desert. But also they found that those skeletons, and those skeletons people were buried facing south. And so probably that north-south alignment had something to do with, with their religion as well. And then on the right is the alignment for the, for, the star, for the stars. They're all radiating from a central point, and apparently they found a, a crude skeleton of a, a, a crude um, stone shaped like a, a, a cow, and it is believed that these people were, were very much uh, worshipping cattle. 
and there's reason to believe that these people might have been very much related to uh, the, the Maasai people in culture. This picture here is to demonstrate the principle behind the stone alignments. What you have there is a picture of the same area of the, along the horizon. At the same time, around the same uh, day, uh, on, on the 22nd of each, of each month. So in January, you see that the sun is rising on the left there. And in January, you can see that the rising points are shifting until you reach June when the, uh, the sun uh, rising point starts shifting back again to, uh, to where it was in January. So this is basically what the stones were meant to, to measure. And, and the reason was so that people can determine seasons and it was a kind of a calendar as well. This is 7,000 years ago. Uh, this is before the pyramids were built in, in Egypt. Another topic which is very close to, to my heart is when I was young, when, when they used to talk about Galileo, I used to ask myself, what about us? What were our people doing at the time when Galileo and them were thinking about uh, all of these things? And I'm sure for a while people thought that, you know, it's almost nonsensical to ask this question because apparently nothing was happening in Africa. Um, and I'm going to show you that there are indications that it is not, uh, I mean, it, it does make sense to ask that question, given the conditions that were prevailing around the same era that Galileo uh, was alive. And to do that, um, I'm going to paint a picture for you of what West Africa was like uh, around the time that Galileo was alive. It was in the 1500s. West Africa, large parts of West Africa were under the Songhai Empire, which is the orange uh, area there on the map, on the, in the map on the left. And the thing about empires is that they, pro they provide protection. So trade routes were protected. As a result, um, you know, cities developed and became prosperous trading points. And prosperous trading points in stable areas attract scholars and, and all other people. And as a result, uh, many learning centers were established in West Africa. It is not, um, Timbuktu is the most famous one, but there were learning centers all over. I mean, in other cities, in Jenne, in Walata, in Mauritania, well, in what is currently uh, Mauritania. And uh, I mean, in, in those schools, there is evidence to suggest that the subjects that were covered included astronomy, mathematics, optics, literature, law, and Islam. And uh, I mean, the most famous learning center, in fact, was uh, associated with the Sankore Mosque. Uh, that is where some of the famous uh, scholars in West Africa came to learn. And in this picture here, on the left, you see a very proud man smiling in front of a building. I'm proud because uh, I was told that that building is the remains, of, the remains of a house where one of the famous professors in the 1500s used to live. Uh, his student who became even more famous, uh, Ahmed Baba's uh, house is also there in Timbuktu. So that, that picture on the left there is in Timbuktu and I'm uh, standing in front of that, uh, the house of Professor Bagayogo who used to teach Ahmed Baba. Ahmed Baba became very famous in North Africa. Uh, he wrote over 60 books. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, so a lot of a book, tra book trading was, uh, a book trade thrived around the 1400s and the 1500s um, in this area, uh, areas covered by the Songhai Empire. So people used to bring books from North Africa and they also used to write books themselves. So there was a lot of trading in books. And uh, unfortunately, in 1592, um, the Songhai Empire was um, destroyed, um, was invaded by Morocco. Some of the scholars were, um, you know, they were, they left the area. And fortunately, many of the, uh, the descendants or many of the families of the scholars kept a lot of the libraries of these scholars. 
And today, uh, we are very lucky that those books still survive, although, unfortunately, in a very bad state of repair, as you can see. Just to give you an idea, in Mali, alone, there are over 200 private libraries there, each containing an average of about 3,000 manuscripts. So there's lots and lots of these books in Mali, in West Africa, all the way to Sudan, and even to um, in the, the Swahili-speaking part of Africa. And I was very uh, interested to find out that, uh, that Swahili has written records going back 800 years. Uh, I'm part of uh, a project to go and search for astronomy and mathematics and science in these books. And we have already identified and we are in possession of 37 astronomy manuscripts, thanks largely to, to the Department of Science and Technology and the Ministry of Education, uh, Department of Science and Technology in South Africa, and the Ministry of Education in, in Mali. Um, just to show you what has been found in some of these books, we haven't started the project of, of translating the books, but some other people have been there searching for different things, for, for history um, and law, and they found this record of meteor showers in 1583. This is very exciting because it suggests to me that there is a possibility that you can find records of other things like supernova explosions and things like that. So there's a lot of things that you can uh, determine uh, in, in, in these in this books. I mean, this record was made by Mahmoud Al-Kati, who was a historian in the 1500s in, in Mali during the Songhai Empire. Uh, I mean, he, he wrote the history of the whole region, and, which is very nice because... I mean, it gives you records of what, is, what was happening in that area. Uh, yeah. Uh, on the left is a page taken from one of those manuscripts. And apparently, this manuscript was written in the 1200s in Morocco and was commented on in the 1700s. So the scholarship did not end with the invasion of 1592, but continued probably until the 1900s or the 1800s. And uh, I mean, the, the pressing question would be, how do we know? If you find something like this, how do we know that the people who, the, the people who are in possession of this book uh, actually read that book? I mean, it's not enough that you kept a collection of this, but you need to know that the people who kept this collection actually read it. You know, in that way you can, you can say that they, they have contributed uh, to what's, in, uh, what's in, in, in that book. And uh, it, is, it will be easy in this case to tell because paper was very scarce during that time. West Africans, it seems, never developed the, the paper-making uh, industry. And so a lot of them used to write on the margins of, of these books. So from the comments that are written on the margins of these books, you can tell, um, you can tell that this book has been read and also, apparently, you can distinguish between West African Arabic script and North African Arabic script. And therefore, you can tell whether this was written by someone in West Africa or not. And often in these manuscripts, people write, I mean, the people who wrote the manuscript write their names down. They even write their clan and, and things like that. So there's a lot of information that you can get from this. And in this way, we hope that we'll be able to build a picture of... Um, a, we'll be able to build a picture of, of the level of, um, of science research or participation in science in West Africa. Unfortunately, uh, around the time of the Songhai Empire, Islamic science was already at, at, at reached its peak in the previous centuries. And so, uh, I mean, it will be interesting to see whether they were still thinking about ideas and so on. Um, Islamic science has contributed, uh, I believe, the five functions of trigonometry. And also, I mean, they, <clears throat> it was driven by the need to determine, to calculate time, and also the need to determine the direction uh, to Mecca, the Qibla. And uh, it will be interesting to go to West Africa and look at some of those old mosques. I mean, uh, the Sankara Mosque, I believe is between 600 and, and 700 years old. And there's another one, the Jingeri Bell Mosque, which is older than the Sankore. And by going there and determining 
how accurate uh, the, the Qibla or the, the, the direction to Mecca was, you would be able to, uh, to tell whether they used scientific uh, methods in their determination of, of those directions. So I think this is very exciting, I mean, and this is a possibility. You know, it, this gives us a possibility to be able to ask that ever-pressing question that our young people back in Africa and, and, and Africa and diaspora always ask themselves, you know, what about us? What did our people do uh, so long ago? And it would be very nice if once we have uh, worked out answers to, to those questions, that they may, uh, those answers uh, make, make their way to, our te to the textbooks and things like that. And uh, in summary, we have basically this timeline showing that the history of the recorded, if you can call it recorded, history of the participation of Africa in astronomy goes back at least 7,000 years, which is older than any other continent on Earth. So 7,000 years ago, you had the Naphtha stones in, in, in uh, Egypt. And then about 2,000 years ago, you have the Namuratunga stones in Kenya, which function the same way as the Naphtha stones, and like Stonehenge. And then 600, 700 years ago, you had uh, Islamic, uh, the possibility of Islamic science uh, in, in West Africa, and probably even in East Africa, I don't, you don't know. And then presently, uh, we are you know, carrying the torch forward with fantastic projects like SALT, and possibly in the future, the square kilometer array. Um, so I think things look quite bright for astronomy in Africa. Yeah, thank you very much. We have time for questions, and we've arranged for microphones to come round. And because, as I remind you, this is being webcast, can I please ask you, when you're asking a question, to stand up. That way the cameras can find where you are. What I will attempt to do is to identify one and two so that the microphones can be moving around uh, correctly and pick you up. But if you wait till the microphone comes and stand up to ask your question, that will make life a lot easier for the people who are facilitating around the hall. Um, please, there's a question here. And then... Uh, Um, <clears throat> Dr. Malubi, um, you implicitly or possibly not very directly contrasted tribal superstition, e.g. among the Bushmen, with modern science. Sorry about this, uh, I'm too far away. Um, I think last week a new planet was discovered, mm -hmm. 80 light years away, phenomenal distance. My question is... How do we know that planet exists? If we know by visual observation, how come a man-made telescope can see a distance of 80 light years? I wonder if you could explore that with us. Okay. Well, yeah, there, there are different techniques of determining, of searching for planets outside the solar system. Uh, one of the methods which uh, our telescope, SALT, would be able to use is by searching for, for the pool or the tag that uh, the parent star has or that the planet has on the parent star. So you look at the star, and if, it, if there is evidence that its motion has been affected by something that you cannot see around it, then uh, by determining uh, the masses of the two, you can tell whether the, the thing that you cannot see but which is having an effect on the star is a planet or not, based on the mass that you can estimate. Okay, so that's the method that, um, of, 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 of studying the velocity or the movement of the, the parent star. Um, the other method, in fact, which was the first successful method to produce a planet was by looking at the, the pulsars. Pulsars are the remains of very massive stars that 
have completely died. And uh, by looking at, by timing the pulses, you know, these remains are rotating very fast and are emitting uh, energy in radio waves. By, by timing these pulses from this uh, pulsar, you can, uh, if you determine any changes, you can tell whether that pulsar has something like a planet orbiting around it. And in fact, this is how the first planet outside our, uh, our solar system were determined. And then the other method is by direct photograph using a, a, a very powerful telescope. And uh, I mean, there are projects in the future to send things into space uh, to, to search for, for, for these uh, smaller um, planets. And so the issue about telescopes is that they have resolving powers, you know. And the resolving power has to do with the size of the aperture of the telescope. The bigger the size, the more resolution you get, the deeper you can see into space because you are able to collect a lot of light and therefore you, know, you, you, you can expose and see much deeper into space. And that is really how people are able to, um, to see things that are so far away into space. I hope I have answered. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question here, please. And if anybody else is asking a question, I can sort of set you up. And then another one here. Um, in the historical context, we associate the astrolabe with uh, Arabic astronomy. Uh, are there any other particular instruments that were associated with uh, other regions of Africa? That's a very good question. And to be very honest, I forgot to tell you that this project of manuscript is still at formative stages. And uh, one of the things that we'd like to find out is whether there are any astrolabes uh, in, in West Africa. And uh, yeah, so there are lots of questions that we need to ask. But to me, what fascinated me was just without going, doing much research, already there's evidence to suggest that these people 500, 600 years ago were aware of the, of the, the, the latest kind of science that was happening around that time. I mean, uh, if, if West Africans 600 years ago uh, were having astronomy as part of their curriculum, then probably their level of knowledge of astronomy, I would say, was at the same level as that of the level of knowledge of their counterparts in Europe and other parts of the, of the Islamic world. And, and right now, I mean, it's still tentative things because we have actually not gone and looked at this manuscript and studied them. Yeah. Just here near the front. Okay. And then I think I saw a hand right over there. Is there good evidence about early astrology in Africa? Uh -huh. Yeah. You see, among the 37 um, manuscripts that I told you about, a lot of them actually contain astrology. But I believe during the times that you are talking about here, there was very little distinction between astronomy and astrology. And uh, I mean, for us, we still find those manuscripts interesting because even though they're about astrology, they can give you an idea of the level of knowledge that these people had about, about the, the night sky. Yes, sir. Um. Do you have any explanation for um, why stones appear from other locations? Um, like, you know, there are lots of stories and correlates with Stonehenge and alien intelligence, etc. So as a scientist, what, what explanation do you have? Okay. Well, my explanation is that, is that as, as a scientist, I think it's, I'll be correct in saying that we completely do not believe in aliens. <laughs> because, I mean, we have searched for life in the solar system. So far we haven't found any. I mean, there, there, are very, there are possibilities, there are very promising areas like Mars, that may be beneath the surface of Mars, because people have found evidence of methane gas and uh, water there, methane gas poss possibly being I mean, the methane gas in, in Mars could have been emitted by bacteria there or could be emitted by vol volcanic activity in Mars. Uh, so in other words, the, the possibility that of life so far in the solar system 
um, it's not zero because of these uh, possibilities. But even if we find life, we, ex we expect that kind of life to be bacterial and not to be intelligent, to come in and, and, and drop stones on earth or, <laughs> or things like that. Um, and so we don't believe that. I mean, the, we believe that possibly people were so devoted to their religious beliefs that they, they I mean, they, they, took, they made efforts and took trouble to drag these stones, which meant a lot to them, to where they wanted uh, to put these stones, you know. Um, can I just ask people, once I've, they've caught my eye and I've said yes, could you please keep your hand up? Because the people with the, the microphones then lose you and can't find out. We have one right at the back and then one just in front and then one here. Um, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Very informative and uh, very interesting. I'd just like to know whether you have come across the history of Robert Temple and uh, Marcel Griol, who have actually uh, went to the Dogon and uh, research about uh, the uh, Digitaria. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, they, they say that there are three of them. Yeah. We know about two of them, but there's one C which haven't, we haven't seen yet. How you come across that and explain a little bit more about that, please. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Whenever I'm asked that question, I, I immediately see disappointment in people's faces when I give them answers. <laughs> and that is because, uh, I mean, I was, we, we went to the Dogons. We spent three weeks with the Dogons. And the filmmakers, uh, they're not scientists, so they were very curious about this also. So one of the first questions they asked the Dogons was whether they knew anything about this Sirius A and Sirius B which apparently the Dogons are supposed to know existed without, uh, without having had telescopes. I mean, the knowledge of Syria, the companion of Sirius, was only uh, found, I mean, discovered uh, in the 1800s by someone with a telescope of this size, about 25 centimeter in diameter. So then the Dogons would have knowledge of this uh, was a mystery. So we went and we asked them, and uh, none of them seemed to know anything about this. <laughs> and I mean, and we were not the first people to, uh, to get that kind of response, because I believe also in the early 90s or early 80s, uh, Belgian uh, people went there to the Dogons and asked them the same questions, and the answer again was no there. So I mean, I, I feel comfortable with that answer, because otherwise, uh, as a scientist, it would, have, it would have been very difficult for me to explain how they, they came to know uh, that kind of information. <laughs> and somebody there with the microphone. Yes, I, I passed here. because I was going to ask the same question. <laughs> oh, right, okay. So we have one down here. Um, looking around for Dr. Anymore. Madube, your studies and your, the knowledge you acquired obviously gives you much joy. You. Why and what is the significance of that for us today? Thank you. Okay, this, this is a very personal question. I think for me, it's about pride. It's about pride that I've been denied by apartheid and by whatever system that tried to, uh, to take away our history from us. The, the fact that we can go back and, uh, and do a proper study of our history and come up with very positive and affirming kind of information is very good because the result of this negative uh, policies and negative teaching that we have had as African people in the world is evident today. I mean, in Britain, I was here in October last year, and, and, and it seems like in Britain there is a problem of attracting black children into science. Is it because, uh, because they don't see themselves in the books that they are reading that they, they, they're they being alienated from science. Um, and so studies of this kind, hopefully for me, is about correcting and making sure that we bring science closer to our people and that they can take pride in their history just like other people have, have done. Any more questions around? There's one down here, please.
Midubi, thank you very much. I know that it's cold here in Britain, but I think your story has made some of us a little bit warmer so we can face the evening. <laughs> uh, I've just got two little questions. The first one is uh, you've spoken about how our history was denied by systems that were obviously, I think, beyond our control. Now that there is this kind of information, indisputable in some way, what is the response of those people that have denied us this information as, as you walk around? The second question is, obviously, you have painted here a picture of a people in a continent that were also doing similar things that were being done in other continents, particularly the continent of Europe. What is the story of, say, the American Incas or the Asian people in relation to studying the stars? What is their story? Is there a story or there is none? Or if there is, where does it start? Mm -hmm. In a comparative manner. Okay. I don't think those are two little questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the first one is very tough. Let me start with the second one. The, the answer to the second one is, is just one sentence, the same. That is the greatest lesson I've learned from all of this. Uh, it doesn't m mean to show that Africans were better than anyone or anyone else was better than Africans. It just means that we are all inspired by the sky in the same manner. And to me, that is enough. I mean, that, that, that was very great, you know, that was very affirming. Uh, um, you know, and, and about the first question, I think, I mean, if you go back uh, into back over 10 years ago during apartheid, uh, I mean, people were very dismissive, you know. Uh, I mean, even today, conventional wisdom is that African history is an oral history. Uh, that uh, as a, because of that, I mean, uh, Almost, you know, you cannot make comparisons between Africa and other continents. So I am hoping that with this kind of work, we'll be able to rewrite the history. I mean, I'm not, we are not the only group that is working on these manuscripts. The, for the last 30 years, there are people in America and the Northwestern uh, University who have been studying, making Islam, studying Islamic studies in West Africa. So this kind of work has been known for the last 30 years. Specifically about the sciences and astronomy, this will be a very new kind of work. And I hope that if there are any people who still think differently or negatively about Africa, I hope that the result that will come up will be able to convince them to change and to accept facts. Thank you. There's a question right over at the back there. And then one down here. Uh, you uh, showed us some documentation of uh, meteor showers, mm -hmm. historical documentation, and then mentioned, I think quite excitingly, the possibility of uncovering evidence of supernovas, which I, I believe there is European evidence for historically, but I'm not sure about that. If, if you were to uncover something, what would you hope to be able to, uh, uh, to read in these historical documents? Uh, and are there any particular dates that would be important uh, with respect to other things that we know about the past with supernovas? Yes. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on supernova studies, but I believe that if you can get correct dates for when the supernova exploded, uh, you can put constraints on the, 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 the physical theories describing uh, the remnants of these supernovas. Uh, and that, that, I mean, is like, you know, high-tech kind of science, you know. For, uh, using history. Um, it is very difficult to see how you would go about searching for supernovae in this manuscript because there's lots and lots of them. I mean, the 37 manuscripts that I'm, I've talked about are a result of searching only a third of the library. There's a major government library in Timbuktu. It has 20,000 manuscripts, and the 37 came from a third of that. We found another 30, around 30, in another smaller library. Uh, again, only a fraction of, of that library has been catalogued. So it's going to be a lot of uh, hard work searching for these things. And uh, it will involve a lot of collaboration with other groups 
who are doing, who are doing non-scientific things on this kind of manuscript, but it is an exciting kind of topic. Yeah. There was a, somebody here has the microphone. Hi, uh, I'm afraid a far more uh, contemporary question. Um, you know, I think that uh, most of us found this a very, very inspirational talk and uh, envy your students who get to hear this every week. But <laughs> my, my question is, given, given the fact that, that Africa can't afford a Hubble, Africa can't devote the resources that, that, that the US uh, or Europe can, um, you're inspiring your students. Is, what, what, what is the outlook in the future for, for African astronomy? Are there places to take them? Are there, is there funding for, for you know, positions? Okay, thanks. Well, my, my first answer is that astronomy can be as expensive or as cheap as you want it to be. Today, people are talking about virtual observatories where you don't have to own a, a telescope to access those uh, virtual observatories. And hopefully, when these virtual observatories where, I mean, data have been stored, are becoming, become a common thing and become well established, they'll be made accessible even to poorer countries. So, and also, I mean, if you look at Eastern Europe, I mean, it was not in the same condition that Africa is. Nonetheless, I don't think they had lots of access to big telescopes, but I think they developed very fantastic schools of theoretical astrophysics. So even poor countries can develop uh, 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 skills and things in, 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 in theoretical astrophysics, or they can still participate in, in theoretical astrophysics. But much more relevant to South Africa, uh, we are very lucky that we have a government that uh, supports science. I mean, I'm sure our government is aware of the problems that we are having, socioeconomic problems that we are having. But I'm sure they also understand that uh, you, know, you can develop things in a parallel way. You can still look, uh, look for the, I mean, you can still uh, try and solve the socioeconomic problems and at the same time still develop your strong points because astronomy has been the strength of South African research. I mean, our, the, our observatory in Cape Town, the history goes back over 200 years, or almost 200 years. And uh, so it was an existing infrastructure which our government uh, fortunately realized that it would be not a good idea to destroy it because once you have sorted out your economic, uh, uh, socioeconomic problems, you, if you don't do them parallelly, then you have to go back and develop the scientific culture, which takes a very long time to develop. And anyway, it seemed to me that countries that are developing today are countries that have invested in, in, um, in knowledge creation, and astronomy is part of knowledge creation. And uh, so I think things are, are very great in terms of astronomy, support for astronomy in South Africa. And, and as I said, I mean, we have... SALT, uh, which is almost operational right now. I mean, there's already science coming out of the Southern African Large Telescope. Uh, so people um, can access that. And not just in South Africa, even within the whole of Africa. Uh, I mean, people can access it because all you need really is a good project and access to the internet in order to access uh, SALT. Yeah. Thanks. I'm going to pull things to a close now, and I'd like us all to thank Dr. Medupe very much indeed for a wonderful lecture and for answering all the questions. So let's, let's thank him. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Malusi Malulu, who is the first secretary from the South African High Commission. We're very pleased to be able to be with us, and he's going to say a few words on behalf of the South African government and the High Commission, I think. Welcome. Please. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I've been asked to make a vote of thanks specifically to Dr. Tebe Medupe for the very enlightening and illuminating presentation he has just made. You will be aware from my presentation that I'm not a scientist by profession. Hence, uh, the vocable so suggests. 
Uh, Minister Musbudi Mangena, Dr. Tebe Medupe, Dr. Julia Higgins, the Executive and Fellows of the Royal Society, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the South African High Commissioner, Dr. Lindy Wimabuza, I wish to extend warmest congratulations to everyone who has been instrumental in arranging for this event. A special tribute goes to the Royal Society, which has made it possible for all of us to converge here today. I have no doubt that presentations throughout the day have enlightened participants on the vital role that science plays and will continue to play in the efforts of humanity to understand and interact intelligent 